Hey, everybody. Welcome to the third floor. I've never been up here, but this is uh, sort of the bird's eye view of Skirball. So um, the tone of this uh, talk is we're going to try to keep it light and lively and pick, keep the pace up. Um, hopefully everybody can come away with some information that they did not have before they came in here. Um, we're going to move around the ecosystem of entertainment and media, digital, social, advertising, monetization, data, tactics, you name it. This is, uh, we're, we're, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We've got an awesome panel here. Um, my name's Mark Carson. Um, I've been coming to digital Hollywood panels for a long time, and uh, very happy to be a part of uh, the sort of moderation uh, component. Um, the, the evolution of everything we're going to talk about happens here, and we see it years before things happen, and we see um, you know cycles as they play themselves out. We're also going to talk about some of that today as well. We were just talking earlier about uh, multi-channel networks, and there's a lot of change there, and that was a big subject here over the last few years. So anyway, we're going to start at the end with Tanya, and everybody's going to you know, introduce themselves and quickly talk about what they do during the day. Like, what do you do on your average day at the office? So thanks for coming, everybody. Take it, Tanya. Hi, everybody. I'm Tanya Yuki. I'm the founder and CEO of Shareably. And uh, we measure uh, basically every single shared moment between a consumer and a piece of content across any of the measured social networks. Um, so what I do most of the day, um, other than just make sure um, everything's going well and that we're um, thinking about our roadmap, is really just uh, spend a lot of time analyzing some of the new formats and new trends that are emerging to try and place bets. Um, I feel like this space used to be a, you know, if you hear about something new, you can hang back, see what happens for the first six months to a year, and then if it's real, you can kind of go into it. Whereas now, I feel like if you overhear at the Starbucks that something new is happening, you're like racing back to the office going, quick, how do we measure this? Um, so I think my job is really to figure out, you know, which five bets we should be placing in terms of proactive measurement, knowing that maybe two of them will um, will pan out in terms of real kind of audience growth. But those two will potentially make a huge difference to, to the industry and to our clients. Hi, I'm Scott Booth, and I was a retired hedge fund manager at Tiger and founder of Lead Edge Capital, which is a tech venture private equity firm and was convinced to come out of retirement to start a social media strategy for Major League Baseball Players Association uh, based upon some of the companies that we had founded way back, which is basically uh, the idea that um, people socialize around their, their primary interests, that everybody has certain passionate interests, and that the way that media evolves is it goes from oligopoly centered around technology innovation, whether it's movie studios or terrestrial networks, to a environment where content actually leads as opposed to technology. Think of it as cable providing specialized channels. So on the back of organizing um, a social media strategy, media plus tech strategy for baseball, we were asked by Lady Gaga to launch one for her fans. And we now are in discussions with NBA, NFL, FC Barcelona, India Cricket, and um, college football to do the same. So we DJ bar mitzvahs. I don't know why I'm up here. <laughs> uh, we are. <laughs> we got a community for that. Yeah. Um, I'm Ryan Dieter. I'm the CEO and co-founder, actually founder of Influential. Uh, we are an AI influencer technology that matches brands and ad agencies to influencers through transparent data and machine learning. It's across all social platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, and YouTube. The opposite of an MCN as opposed to a, a William Morris or CAA or MCN that is Kind of pitch you a roster of talent. We have found 15,000 of the most highly engaged influencers across all these social platforms and activate them based on no dog in the fight, but what are the best possible matches for that brand. Day to day, I am speaking to all of our corp dev discussions as it relates to um, IBM, one of our biggest partners for AI, uh, to um, uh, Vice, to Condé Nast, a number of big partners that we're trying to find ways to monetize through 
our ability to sell as well as their ability to use our technology for increased revenues. So uh, that's my day to day. Um, I'm Liz Stalin. I'm the founder of In-House Consulting. Um, our main focus is building both content and distribution strategy together for social media platforms. Um, on the day-to-day -day basis, I work backwards with my clients based on the context of each medium to build plans. Um, we wholeheartedly believe that a creative idea can be informed by what's going on in the environment and that it doesn't just have to be a spark, it can be a well-informed spark. So definitely lots and lots of back and forth ideation and building really robust distribution strategies in conjunction. I'm Darnell Briscoe. I'm uh, the Vice President of Accounts and Employee Number One at McBeard. We're a social media creative agency here in town and also part of the full screen family. Uh, I, uh, on the day to day, I'm in charge of thinking about uh, strategy uh, and content creation and execution uh, across, uh, across television and movies. Um, we've worked on uh, close to 400 uh, TV show and movie uh, campaigns over the last few years, including uh, Deadpool, uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, Homeland, and Star Wars. How do you follow that? Jeez. Uh, My name's Kirsten Benson. I am the co-founder and editorial director of Instant, which is Time Inc.'s uh, new outlet. And it was really launched with us realizing and seeing how influencers are driving business decisions. They're driving Hollywood. They're in major motion pictures. They're on television. And most importantly for me, they're changing and shaping the hearts and minds of Gen Z, so people who were born 1997 or after, and young millennials. And there really wasn't an outlet that was talking to them the way that you would expect a group like this that's influencing so much of culture to be spoken to. So if you look back a couple of years ago, when people were talking about YouTube stars, they would say, she's the most famous person on the internet and you've never freaking heard of her. Or uh, you wouldn't believe how much these idiots are making on YouTube. And it was always this kind of outsider perspective looking in. And so what we do with Instant is we're the first media outlet dedicated to the quote unquote new famous. Um, and we're all media, we're social first, or I mean all video, social first. And then there's also a, a landing page, instant.me. But all of the action happens on social because that's where our audience is and that's where the people who we're covering um, live and breathe. So as far as what I do all day, I run the content team, um, oversee the strategy from the marketing and then also from the sales strategy and then work really closely with clients. So we had Unilever on board recently um, to do a major degree women campaign that was 135 videos that we created with digital stars using tools like yours um, to identify which ones are the right ones and then really work on the content strategy and push it out through instant and timing properties. And uh, so our company Relish Mix tracks um, all activity across all TV shows, all movies, all wide release movies, all broadcast and cable television shows across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And what I do on a daily basis is I work with our clients uh, at the studios and networks and help them adjust their campaigns so they make more money, more box office, better ratings, in a nutshell. So just sort of we're going to bounce around a little bit, but what is the most common problem that your clients have and how do you kind of deal with it? And let's try to keep this as short as we can, but what's... Currently, what is the problem that you deal with on a regular basis? Let's start, Liz, let's start with you. Um, there are a couple. I, I think the biggest issue on a day-to-day -day basis is a lack of understanding about what it means to put content on pay-to-play platforms. Um, you know, there is still, even with really well-educated marketers, uh, a belief that if you put something out in a social channel and you let it be, even if the content's wonderful, that people are going to see it. Uh, you know, you would think at this point um, people would have evolved past it, but you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, marketers are really, really busy, and it takes a while for them to understand that a, a paired distribution strategy, whether it's the use of influencers, whether it's paid budgets, boosting posts, is absolutely a necessity to build a, a scale or scale a business on digital. So I would say, yeah, just the understanding of it's a pay-to-play world. Tanya? Uh, I would say thinking about how to tell the story of the value that they're creating via their social footprints. I think that, I mean, we work with a mix of 
digital first companies as well as more traditional media companies and particularly inside the traditional media or traditional CPG. Um, you know, there's a, I think there's a real confusion on, you know, if I sort of understand that all activity is moving to mobile and that most of mobile is social, if I sort of start with that point, how can I convey that back to my organization in a way that feels real? Um, you know, we hear a lot like, you know, if the business is still doing well, there's a sense that it will continue and that there's no real need to do anything with urgency. So I think a lot of what we get tasked with and what we try and help with is how to sort of say, you know, it's like Rome is burning, you're in Rome, but it's okay. You know, you can still do a lot of good stuff about it. Um, but it is a, it's a real struggle, I think, to both balance what have been traditional KPIs and shift um, the thinking of big organizations to move um, more quickly towards those new opportunities. Anybody else? I, Ryan? I just, I'd say it's literally getting people to rethink the entire social landscape. Because I'm dealing with people who have been trained to think of it as an individual sport. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg gets us all to think about our followers. He doesn't care about followers. He cares about audience. And because we're dealing around subject, which people naturally identify with, it's, it's, it's orienting that it's not about me, it's not about an individual, it's not so fragmented. And realizing that it's no longer a technology problem. The technology is, has, has become ubiquitous. Now it's a case of the inertia around these platforms, which no longer have barriers to entry, and they, but they've done a tremendous job of fragmenting content in a way where it's highly disorganized, and teaching the content contributors that actually own a subject, like baseball players own the subject of baseball, that if they work cohesively, as opposed to individually, they actually have to create less content to basically take back their audience. So how do brands speak authentically uh, to their consumer base, to their audience? Uh, the first question is always, how do you pick the best possible influencers? We have spent tens of millions, other companies have spent um, a certain amount of money as well to find the best possible people. Uh, the solution for us has been through our partnership with IBM Watson, through AI, and through three major pillars, similar to how you do digital media buys and audiences, demographically, psychographically, and contextually. If you can identify the perfect person that hits your right consumer base, that speaks about your product organically, and that actually is themselves adventurous or altruistic or hedonistic, whatever the brand perception is that you want to match with an influencer, you're, we're seeing far higher levels of engagement across these social platforms. So I think the first question brands ask is, how do we be authentic and how do we use different voices to um, hit these people at scale? I, I would say it's finding a clear understanding of what role social should play in the marketing mix. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's not a clear playbook, uh, but you, you get everything from, uh, from people thinking about social as, uh, as a mix for everything. We'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. That is spread across their outdoor, their television, all of their print campaign, and put everything on social. Some people will use it as a catch-all for things that they can't uh, figure out a place for. Uh, the director really loves this piece, but we can't figure out where we're going to put it. So put it on social. Um, and, and really social, and, and you can't even think about social as a, as a singular bucket, but you have to think about the audience groups, you have to think about the platforms, and think about the natural user behavior, and figuring out what role social should play in the larger marketing mix is one of the biggest problems that our clients are facing. And just a client understanding from the top up that it's not... I spent half of my day, I think, explaining that we don't care as much about UVs or unique visitors anymore. We care about reach, and, and you... There's not a, you don't measure it the same way you do with a traditional website. And so there's a lot of confusion in the ranks still. So for us to kind of be evangelizing all of this and get the, the even just the keywords and the terms and the way you, the school of mind back to where it needs to be is um, a challenge for the client and then just a, a fun challenge for all of us too. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting, that what we're seeing is that one of the, simplest and most obvious and greatest solutions for almost everything that we're dealing with with movie um, with movies and TV shows uh, comes down to creative you know what is the content strategy is the first question we ask every one of our clients and usually the answer is I don't know what is the social content strategy we're just going to post some trailers and TV spots and hopefully the stars of the film will spread the word so, you know, we're having to recondition everybody we work with 
on all ends, whether it's the filmmaker, the cast member, the distributor, the media buyer, to rethink the way they approach social as a obviously a unique opportunity um, to get the word out over print, outdoor, radio, TV, and so forth. Um, so give me some examples of some of the solutions you guys have sort of dropped into a campaign, if you can, without you know, exposing any kind of <laughs> major issue, but you know, are there anything, is there anything that comes to mind in terms of a campaign where you realize by simply doing this, all of a sudden activity amplified? For, for us, and I think you've probably seen this too, but it's not all about follower number, and I hope you guys all know this by now, it's about true engagement and the, the audience reaction to a specific influencer or, or person of influence. So I go back to this uh, Degree Women campaign. The client really wanted big people, like big fitness influencers who everyone follows, and if they said it, the name at home around the, t around the table, their daughters would be like, yes, I'm obsessed with them. Um, and for me, I, I looked at the budget and looked at the goals of the campaign, which weren't necessarily just to get um, in front of as many people. It was more about, like, let's get this audience really engaged and tapped into the right talent. And we were able to get over, I think it was over 20 different digital stars for a campaign that they wouldn't have been able to do with even one of the major names. And they still saw massive reach because the content was still really solid. It was engaging, and it didn't matter if it was the biggest dancer on Instagram. The dancer was really good. She hit the right demographic for who they wanted to talk to, and we used tools that allowed us to see, you know, oh, you want to reach women 18 to 25? Okay, we know exactly who you should go to. Um, and because of that, we, we, and we also knew from the data that dancing and movement did very well, so let's, let's focus on a dancing series uh, across social. Uh, we know from previous content that that is what is our top performing, so let's align with that, align with a few people who create cool dances, and it doesn't matter who they are as long as they're reaching the right people, and it, it was a massive success. I think we over-delivered by 30%, and we were brand new, so we were still invisible when they started the campaign, and we grew with them. Who else? Uh, to tack on top of that, um, we call it, and some, some of what you just referenced, it's called micro-segments. Uh, so we learned this about a year and a half ago. We're running campaigns. We realized when you can find the exact individual audience that exists. So um, Chrysler has a 25 to 44 adults giant swath of people. That's not very targeted. What if we could find the people that follow Chrysler on these social platforms? What are their above baseline affinities or um, you know, high levels of engagement, as referenced before? Uh, we saw, for example, the uh, stylish uh, entrepreneur. So we see that they had affinity for GQ and for uh, Ralph Lauren, very, very high above baseline. That informed the video content and the image content as well as the text content that should be talking about the best accessory is my car. Uh, for uh, uh, psychographically, we find out that achievements driving and levels of personal success are very important. So it's all in the top occupation is entrepreneurship, people that follow at Chrysler. So the actual image or video should be them talking about going to meetings all day. I love my most stylish, best accessory ever, which is my car. We're seeing also 30 to 40% higher levels of engagement when you match the best possible influencer that hits that audience mm -hmm. and the content that also hits that micro segment. And you didn't need George Clooney. Correct. Yeah. We, use, we use selfie sticks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we put selfie sticks in front of you know, very valuable content creators like athletes and tell them that they can disrupt Sports Center. Um, and again, it's the idea is to show them that there aren't any technology barriers between them and their audience. So, Ryan, you're touching on a huge uh, subject, which is a panel of its own in the future, but psychographic versus demographic targeting is a major um, opportunity for all digital and social, where certainly on the entertainment side, above 25 or below 25, male, female, and maybe some gender or, you know, um, um, segmentation by race. But now to target people who love car racing for Fast and Furious is an, a natural and obvious opportunity on digital and social. So are you guys, how are you guys wrestling your clients into psychographic versus demographic? 
For us, it's pretty easy. I think people don't need to search Google on what they're interested in. So they already know their passionate interests. If we can organize content, the audience will find that content. So it's not a case of having to take a, a generalized platform and come up with ways to make it more simple for people. The idea is that there's probably, on one hand, the number of truly passionate interests that you'd rather get in a more authentic, deep, uh, specialized way. So they're automatically aggregating themselves as opposed to being a part of a general environment. Yeah, I think I think driving it through an organization is hard. I think, you know, almost everyone will nod their head and go, of course, like I want to target the person who goes fishing a lot for this fishing rod. But then you look at the media plan, and it's like males, 25 mm -hmm. to 49, you know. Um, so I think there's a lot of old habits that are still dying hard. So you do sort of need to show the power of both. Um, but I will just piggyback on the last question too. Um, so one of the biggest slam dunks that we've seen was uh, quite recently, like within the last six months, we actually mapped uh, people's social engagement behavior to household purchasing behavior and not through predictive modeling and not through anything like actual people to people um, and could show that people who engaged a lot with a given brand actually were the heavy household purchases. Um, and I think seeing that tie, like, you know, I think you can go a little overboard with ROI and you want to calculate ROI for absolutely every campaign. It's just cost prohibitive to do so. But proving, you know, at least a certain number of times that what people actually engage with on social is a big predictor and highly, um, you know, highly lined up with what they're actually going to buy at the cash register, I think gives the confidence for many brands to, um, to spend more money with um, a degree of certainty that they perhaps didn't feel like they had before. And that's by far, particularly with like traditional CPG advertisers, um, or retailers or certain financial services, that was by far the most powerful thing to be able to show them. Um, so getting back to influencers a little bit, um, and Ryan, certainly your company is a big mover in this space, which is organizing influencers for a brand to spread the word, which is a real challenge. Anybody who's been a part of any campaign who has influencers attached, trying to organize them and making sure that they, their messaging is on target and their timing is on target, it's you know, like herding kittens, obviously. But, um, but this, this big shift that's happening over the last year with the sort of deconstruction of the multi-channel network of digital and social influencers is now creating sort of a shift and certainly opportunities. What are you guys seeing in terms of full screen and maker studios shutting down and other things that have happened with awesomeness and so forth? Well, influencers aren't going away. So a few years ago, if you had asked me about them, I would have said, let's, I, I don't know, I, didn't, I wasn't drinking the Kool-Aid yet and now they are here to stay, they're taking over the world. Um, there's no doubt about it. And because of that, there's, there's no brand marketing strategy that doesn't involve a person of influence, even if they're not a traditional, quote unquote, like YouTuber or influencer. So as far as how to herd them, because it is a major pain point for companies, um, I think you need to partner with the right, the right people uh, on the back end. So identifying the data points that are important to you for the objective of your campaign and actually knowing what the objective is beyond, we just want to hit a bunch of people or we just want it to go viral. Um, once you identify the right person, then now the world, the MCN world has kind of shifted a lot in the last year, which means that digital stars are a bit more accessible in ways that they weren't before. So with Instant, what we've seen is that they very much value the traditional media component. Digital stars love to be in book in People Magazine and Entertainment Weekly, and we use that to our advantage. As part of the Time Inc. Um, world, we're able to say, um, you know, Let's, let's cover this person's movie or let's cover this person's YouTube Red show. And we're, because of the value that they find in that a relationship, we're able to get them at a much better rate. So if you can find other ways in besides just money, um, that's probably going to be the best way to get the mo more bang for your buck. So access to the digital stars, to the film perhaps that you're working on, or uh, travel, just other things beyond just cold hard cash. Uh, so the MCN model is antiquated in the sense that you had they have to pay influencers and upfront, at least the bigger mm -hmm. ones, which means that they have a dog in the fight. And they have to get them their pool in the backyard, otherwise they get fired, and they go to makers or somewhere else. 
uh, for co companies like us, we are, specifically, we are extra agnostic. We have no dog in the fight. Other people still have some variation to it. And that, to me, is the future because you have programmatic social. It's not about who has the publishers and selling into those, uh, those activations. Um, data is what we invested in, and data is where the dollars are being spent from the media dollars. Um, we get majority of our dollars from ad agencies, 80% so of our money, and they're usually six to seven figure campaigns versus a one-off $25,000 PR budget or brand budget. Uh, so now I know full screen and others have started to shift, and in fact, a lot of them have come to us and said, can you just give us more deal flow to the people below our top you know, few key influencers? Um, and I think that's gonna happen more and more, and that model of paying people up front ahead of time just doesn't make any sense from economic or in terms of providing the best possible service to a brand. And, you know, even outside of the MCN world, I mean, the idea of working with influencers has grown so much over the last few years. I think we're now at the first time when, you know, medium-sized businesses, which are the vast majority of my clients, can afford to work with influencers, and especially micro-influencers. I've seen an, an unbelievable amount of success working with people who have, you know, a smaller following across social platforms, but their followers are obsessed and live and die for them, and they have their own branded hashtags for their communities. So there's... We're definitely at a place where people, regardless of you know if they can afford you know six, seven-figure deals, they can utilize other human beings versus just tr traditional or boosting ad units. Um, I'm going to ask a question. That you know what? L let me just show a few slides. A few of the our panelists actually uh, sent a slide or two that we could. Show since we do have AV capabilities. Ryan, this is you. Sure. Uh, so people talk about ROI. There's a number of ways to measure ROI besides just impressions or in demo impressions or engagements. But for example, you know, click through and an actual conversion. Uh, there is ad recall rates, similar to older kind of models from TV. Uh, there is search volume lift. Uh, there is you know, viewer retention. All of these things we're seeing far higher, not just from our campaigns, which we believe are the best at, but no matter what, across all of social, using influencers, it's better than the average uh, banner ads, uh, pre-rolls, or otherwise. Just it's performing far better because it's authentic and it's not being uh, you know put behind or under a uh, you know a paywall or something below the fold. It's actually happening in someone's feed natively. Excellent. Um, and now, Scott, we've got a few slides of yours. There's a selfie stick. <laughs> <laughs> but effectively just showing, you know, uh, uh, content creators that their value isn't zero, like Facebook has taught them, that the $30 billion that they, Facebook or social media platforms generate in revenue per year, going for $30 million in uh, sponsorship is not really a fair distribution, and there's really nothing to stop you from taking back your share. This is just an extension of the f previous. Yeah, it, it, it's it's tricky because you know it's 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 about the problem is a business solution now. It's not technology, and so one of the reasons you know I would run for cover from all these VCs that would start the sort of what I call the coattail model, which is if I can get a whole bunch of celebrities to do what I ask them to do, I can make a lot of money off of it, as opposed to saying or the other one, which is the next great platform is going to be some new innovation in technology. It's realizing the fact that there's enough functionality for people to, to, to consume content that matters to them without there being a technological barrier. But what you have to do is you have to organize and originate content. Similar to the way that Ted Turner looked at cable and says, I think 24-hour news is a great concept. Now I've got to come up with 24 hours of news. And so the problem is much more a media problem. And so when we say the power shift has begun, it's not, we're getting 100% adoption from these, these people that recognize themselves in the offline world as owning a subject matter. Where the difficulty is, is teaching them and teaching the organizations that are around these interests, because they're interests, but they're not enterprises. There's no, they, they tend to have this void of executive organization to them. So we literally have to have the playbook in place and getting them to realize it's just starting. It's, you're a startup. You know, frankly, we should be called Pied Piper because that's what our model is, right? <laughs> um, they have to buy into it, but then they also have to understand that there has to be a media playbook to follow. So, 
in our um, in our business of uh, marketing and tracking and reporting uh, movies and TV shows, there we sort of developed this little chart uh, recently that kind of encapsulated the strategy and methodology of most movies. Which, if you look at the bottom, there's a line that's the opening weekend for a movie, and this basically is shows a general pattern of content that gets released along the way, and it's you know, somewhat inconsistent, and the line that goes across the bottom, you see a lot of sort of inconsistencies. And once a movie opens, typically the activity has a tendency of tapering off quickly. But if done right, and, con and content is created on a consistent, continuous uh, basis early um, across all platforms, the social media universe has a tendency to mu grow much larger, and the um, activity has a tendency of sustaining itself much longer, which also obviously drives box office. So just this is just a sort of a, a global overview, simple statement, which is to say more content earlier and consistently across all platforms, which to us is pretty obvious, but this is just a way of saying sooner than better. Okay, so now getting back. Um, how do you guys measure success? For some of you have technology that you own, some of you use other uh, tools and platforms for measuring. But um, what is the measure of success t for your clients? Or do you, how, how do you report success? Sure, uh, so I mean, every time you think about measurement, I always like to split it out into two buckets. So on the one hand, you've got the how many bucket, and on the other hand, you've got the how good bucket. And I think things start getting weird when you try and smush the two things together. Um, so when you think <coughs> about counting, um, most of our clients definitely focus on uh, sort of unique reach, uh, things like how many actual unique people engaged across all of their properties. Um, some will still tout fans and followers numbers because it's always good to slap on a big old number and it makes us feel good. But, you know, I think right now the, the consensus is that that's not really the right KPI. Um, so just focusing on the people who are doing stuff in relation to content um, and then increasingly also using video views as sort of a leading indicator around um, engagement rates and things. And then to, to look at the um, how good was it bucket, um, you know, some, like, some of the metrics that we're thinking a lot more on is how to gauge content quality. Um, and that's really hard to do from a programmatic standpoint. So one thing that we'll see more of um, are looking at things like the views to engagements ratio or the views to shares ratio, for example. How many people needed to view it before they did something? Or how many people needed to be exposed to it before they reacted to the content? So things like that. Um, and then more traditional ROI models that look at changes in behavior and things that look a little more like a brand lift study or, or a behavior lift study. Yeah, I would agree with, uh, I would agree with that, um, especially in theatrical marketing and television. A lot of, uh, a lot of the lift that, uh, that studios are expecting from, uh, from uh, partners is awareness. It, it's very top of funnel. Um, and, and so when you look at data, when you try to figure out the KPIs, it really has to be a mix of, uh, of art and science. And by that, I mean you have to look at the qualitative um, in addition to the quantitative. The raw numbers are great, um, but understanding what they mean and how they affected uh, the campaign uh, are, are even more important. I think about the uh, the recent Call of Duty uh, trailer, which, uh, which came out for Infinite Warfare. When you look at the raw numbers, it's really impressive. 30 plus million views. Um, but when you look at even the very front facing data from a qualitative standpoint, how people cared about it, it's the second most disliked video of all time. Uh, it's, a, it's a 6x uh, when you look at the like versus likes, the thumbs up versus thumbs down, and all types of variations through that. And so when you have something that is high in numbers, but everyone hates it, then, uh, then really like you, you, you have to take into account both of those things to figure out what success looks like. So is it a success? 
It was not a success. <laughs> we were not part of that trailer, but it was not a success. And, you know, that raises the question on Ghostbusters, which opened last year, which was decimated, you know, as far as conversation was concerned and got an, an enormous amount of press because of the negative thumbs ups and thumbs down on YouTube, especially. And the movie was good. And it was actually very good, but so many people did not show up because the social went down. A lot of a lot of naysayers, a lot of trolls, a lot of men were <laughs> comparing it to the original, and it and it got destroyed. So that's an obvious marketing challenge, and uh, and certainly a marketing opportunity to to look at you know some of the <laughs> tactics and reports um, early and make adjustments. And that's where certainly all of our clients are learning, you know, how to look at, you know, activity and make adjustments based on what they see. Well, and just to press on that for a second. So, um, you know, you see a statement, the movie was good, right? And it was good according to you, I presume, because you saw it. Um, and it's, I think there's a really important power shift happening. And we hear this a lot, like with, um, some of our studio clients who will use our data to also identify top influences and things like that. And they'll be like, okay, so I get this person is engaging, but are they any good? Like, are they actually good actors? Are they, you know, is the stuff they're doing quality? You know, and I kind of go, well, I don't know, like 8 million people think so every time they make a video, like it seems good enough. Um, but that concept of what good is and who owns the definition of good. Like if millions of people think it's not good, you know, that that sticks now. And that, that might have been there before, but it was just hard to spread that sort of word of mouth um, before social existed. And now it, you know, now it really has changed the balance of power, I think, around content. Right. And early on with social and uh, social listening tools that measured positive, negative, and neutral, now like with... IBM to measure tone, so you know angry versus um, you know negative and happy versus positive or skeptical and you know all of the ranges of t you know emotional tone become much more telling than just the simplicity of positive and negative. And certainly on the brand side. There's not a brand that doesn't want positive, you know, all the time. But when you have a comedy or some controversial movie, you know, you're not going to get, po you know, negative can be, po can be, an, you know, a show of intent to go see a film, obviously. Um, so back to, you know, measuring and reporting. What do you, tell me more about what you guys are doing to, to, to connect your, your uh, clients. Well, one thing, it's it's a really simple example, but it's definitely been really impactful, is just getting a really good link tracker for any social platform. I mean, there are so many amazing proprietary tools. There's so many great you know vendors and companies who are building large-scale large, large scale tools that can do everything from qual to quant measuring. But being able to track if somebody clicks on a link and what they do subsequently through a post on a social platform is so powerful. So I, you'd be amazed at how many companies don't really do that or they think they do it, but they don't have the pixel set up on their site to really judge the traffic. So I think one main focus uh, that, that I have is just making sure clients understand what it means to track activity to a third party from a, a non-owned platform. Very, very simple and straightforward, but hugely important. So one of the things that we have to do to compete is with the Facebooks of the world is something that they don't do, which is create an attribution engine. Facebooks is very simple. They multiply every, everything by zero, and that's your share of the, um, of the revenue. <laughs> it gives us a very unique opportunity to do something that they're not going to do, right? That, they're, that their board would never allow them to do, frankly, which is to take all the data that we have internally and to analyze it in a way where we come up with a very rich, robust attribution engine that becomes our credibility for every content provider for us. So there's no longer this, th these are all referential statistics, right? We're talking about direct data. And so if we're doing that and we have an incentive to do it because we need to show the value of content contribution because we are sharing it. It's almost something that has to get audited and get reported to every one of the enterprise apps. So that in building that, we will be de facto building a better way to present that information to the third parties, the CPGs of the world who are actually looking to advertise against it. 
Yeah, and when you think about the studios, it's it's trying to social listening. I think gives them such an advantage, probably um, an unused and untapped advantage, uh, to find out what people actually already care about. Um, it, it's our job as marketers, especially in social, to find all of the small fires we can and pour as much gasoline on them. Um, as we can. One of the things that we saw really early with Deadpool early on was there was a ton of just early buzz and conversation about is this going to be rated PG-13 or is this going to be rated R? Uh, and, and we saw that over and over again as a trend and a, a conversation that was popping in different places and with different audiences on different platforms. Um, and so using that information, uh, that allowed us to understand what the opportunity was to work closer with, uh, to work closer with 20th Century Fox to uh, eventually uh, create a, a full activation that started with seeding out to a handful of blogs where we knew that audience was, rumors that it was going to be PG-13, to start to get that conversation going, to start to even incite a little bit of intentional anger. So that way on April 1st, on, on April Fool's, we could drop this big stunt with Mario Lopez uh, that had uh, Ryan Reynolds uh, inter interviewed by Mario Lopez, eventually killing Mario Lopez, and announcing to the world that it's going to be rated R in a nice kind of cool surprise and delight way that a year and a half before before the movie was out allowed a core audience to say like okay we've been talking and you've been listening uh, like I'm on board um, okay just to do a little shift um, so as TV everywhere which has obviously been a big conversation at digital Hollywood for the last five seven years TV everywhere now is everywhere and it works it's getting better month by month. So as, you know, the theme of this talk is entertainment, you know, what what are you guys seeing? How are your clients, you know, TV networks and movie studios shifting as they are feeding content across streaming platforms, their own, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, and so forth? What What are some of the major changes you've seen in the last year? I think one of the biggest changes is a true commitment to crafting content that works on mobile. Um, I think what we used to see a lot of and what we still see to a certain degree with some um, traditional media companies is kind of taking something that looks amazing in CinemaScope, um, but when you kind of squish it down into the mobile experience, it kind of doesn't work. You can't really see the faces, you can't see what's going on. Um, so I think either recutting or shooting in the first place um, designed for a small screen experience, designed to um, to really optimize for what it is that you can see and what's likely to catch your eye and feed, I think is a big thing. Um, you know, you're starting to see some broadcasters like do Facebook Lives at the same time as a big event, um, but it's still really rough, you know, and I, I think there was a great example, which I thought was fabulous. Like it, it wasn't incredibly viewable, but it was fabulous that they did it um, around the live of Hairspray. I don't know if anyone saw that. Um, but they also did a simultaneous Facebook Live for it. Um, the only trick of it was, and it was great that they did it and like amazing, um, but it was shot like up in a crane and sort of in massive widescreen and sort of on an angle. So you were kind of watching it on Facebook Live going, it's amazing that it's here. I can't see or hear anything, but <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to put it on TV, which is probably what um, the intention was to begin with. But I think really um, adopting content that's native for the platforms rather than um, a little bit of an afterthought or something that's designed to merely drive tune-in is, is the big shift that I hope to see because, you know, as much as it's easy to imagine that you're only competing with the people who are on air at the same time. The reality is you're competing for time with everyone. Like they're competing for time with every single one of, you know, the influences that we've talked about. They're competing with global media companies and it, it just gets really hard if you don't really uh, craft for the format. I love the not hot dog app. <laughs> and I think that was just brilliant. And so there's other ways to think about mobile. Um, we're starting to get approached by traditional media around creating short-term social apps for campaigns, specifically campaigns. So they're already thinking to the extent, and it all comes down to ownership, right? There's great existing channels, but when they get 100% of the data and they get all the ownership around that, it's not the proprietary property of Facebook any longer, 
the economics start to make sense for major launches. And it's a conversation that we've started with some of the big media companies around doing dedicated content for their own social. They clearly will have a narrower group, but that concentration gets them to the sort of the tip of the spear in terms of interest. Um, just to add on to what Tony was saying, something else besides you know crafting social first, mobile first content, which is hugely important, um, you're seeing a lot of the networks, most notably Netflix, the marketing campaign doesn't really stop. You know, pre-awareness starts significantly earlier. You look at hugely successful shows like Fuller House, and you look at other shows like uh, you know House of Cards. The social programming, the social conversation starts and then continues. The story evolves on social, sometimes on its own. So there's no beginning, middle, and end to the social story any longer. Um, so I think that that certainly poses a lot of challenges, but it's really exciting uh, for fans who you know are obsessed and waiting for the next season. There's, there's a conversation waiting for them in their phone at all times. Yeah, that's 100% right, and that's totally due to the fragmentation that you mentioned, because people are watching when they want, how they want, where they want, and because there aren't uh, there aren't moments where people are gathering around to consume something at the same time. You now have to keep an always-on campaign, and you also have to build intentional moments for impact. That's the way the algorithms work right now anyways. Organic reach has been going to zero on nearly every platform, and so you have to build big, interesting moments that uh, give people a reason to gather around. Uh, for, uh, for Captain America Civil War, uh, for that campaign, as we were looking at the data in the white space there, we saw uh, that, if you remember, it was paired up fairly closely to Batman versus Superman. And so you have kind of two big uh, face-off superhero movies coming out in a similar fashion, in a similar time frame. And uh, for Batman versus Superman, it really felt a bit distant uh, in a cool way. It was a gladiator match. It was the two biggest superheroes out there, Batman and Superman. And you got to see them go head to head. It was something that you watched as a spectator sport. The thing that we saw that was interesting uh, early with Captain America versus, Civil, uh, versus Iron Man was that people were starting to identify with one or the other um, and starting to take a little bit of ownership, which is the, the best case scenario for social because people talk about my Facebook and my Instagram. They want to tell their own story on social using anyone else's IP. They don't want to tout anyone else or do someone else's marketing. And so for that, we, uh, we used, the, the, which was new at the time, the conversational ad with Twitter, which gave you an A-B functionality where you chose this or that, and then it served you like a video that, uh, was, uh, that was correlated to that, or a coupon uh, for, for people who were in commerce, that kind of thing. Um, and we broke it a little bit uh, on the back end with Twitter creating uh, 1,400 individual videos and, and working on the back end of Twitter to figure out what are the 1,000 most popular names on Twitter. So when you choose Team Iron Man, it says, Tommy, thanks for choosing Team Iron Man. Uh, Liz, like, I can't believe you choose, chose Captain America. And it allows them to both have an, a unique experience uh, that, that is, uh, that's personalized to them, um, and it's something that you want to share with your friends because it's your story, uh, and that allowed us to aggregate a ton of people at once. That first 24 hours, the stats back were about 83 clicks per second, 83 replies, auto replies back for that first 24 hours, and generated about 5.5 million views in those first two weeks between those videos because it was something that was uh, a small moment, a something that allowed someone to say something about themselves, and it was uh, kind of built together in one time, in a, in a concentrated time for impact. The, that was a great campaign. That was, it was great campaign. really cool. Um, customizable stuff in general is just so important. So you, Instagram stories are taking off like crazy. It's yeah. because it's so engaging. You can change it around to speak to you and for your platform because everyone is their own brand manager. But I, I think as overwhelming as this could potentially feel and seem, knowing that your campaign never really ends and you can talk about it forever and there's longevity for in perpetuity. Um, but there's also something so exciting about that in that the barrier, barrier for entry to get into the world of Netflix has shifted so much in the last two years, even if we look at the digital stars. So Colleen Berenger, um, otherwise known as Miranda Sings, she, her, her second season for Netflix, just it, she got renewed for a second season on Netflix just a couple months ago. And that goes to show that uh, it doesn't matter who you are anymore as long as you're creating really cool content. So it's not just coming from the four big studios or, or the 12, but 
Um, that's an exciting moment for us. And I think capitalizing on that and using all these data points that we can pull from our own social media channels that are free and accessible to everyone makes everyone have a, a leg up in the, in the competition. Yeah, I think there's a big shuffle that's taking place at all TV networks as it relates to continuous content. When you think about the off season for a hit TV show that has an, an engaged audience that you want to consider, you know, keeping connected, you know, over the six months in between um, a series. Not to mention um, what this the show uh, Timeless last week, which was announced. Uh, as a cancellation and fans piled on and within three days NBC changed their mind so um, certainly that that's a fan base that's very outspoken but the op but the challenge is certainly for the networks and for studios they're gonna probably adapt as it applies to brands continuous engagement is sort of what they what all brands always do TV networks and movie studios have to kind of rethink how they they uh, you know put it out there. So, in terms of social platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, um, Snapchat certainly is a part of the ecosystem now. What are some of the trends you guys are seeing, um, just in terms of platforms? Cert Twitter has become something different in the last two years. What what are you guys seeing? Everything's built for video. Like, in short, everything is built for video. Everything is uh, pushing video. Everything is, re all algorithms are rewarding video, um, whether it is a live or a story or in feed. Uh, like, social video, you can just remove social uh, and just call it video. And, uh, and the platforms, the social platforms, is where it's going to live. So, uh, we see the majority of our dollars from, from social campaigns on Insta Instagram. Facebook video and for a while there was a fight between Snapchat and Twitter. Twitter has a, made a small resurgence because of the uh, engagement factor, probably because of the, the whole political thing. Um, but And Snapchat also hasn't opened up their APIs yet to provide back demographics uh, and anything that could really be used to glean outside of the fact that it's really cool and some negative news in the press about some of the stock stuff maybe doesn't help as well. Um, so yeah, the, vi uh, video... Snapchat or Twitter? Uh, for, uh, for Snapchat. Snapchat. Because of... Uh, like the, la the lack of uh, user growth that like they saw because of stories. Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, wherever you can create the, the best possible content uh, at the, and the easiest for the influencers, I think you guys all saw what happened with Vine, uh, when they weren't able to find ways to monetize that content, that whole ecosystem went away. And hopefully, a Snapchat also um, jumps in and starts allowing for influencers to make money as well. You can do oh, Please, yeah. you can do simple things like calls to action. So like, when we have uh, digital stars take over the instant Snapchat, we'll have them do things like go to the store and they'll say or hold up Maybelline products for example and say like which one do you like more? And the way you do it is you screenshot, screenshot if you love it. Uh, and, and then we'll, if you love whatever you love most, and should we show one and we show the other, and then you can measure engagement that way. There, it's like a major stupid loophole, but it actually really works and it engages the audience and it makes them feel like they're listening. So with Candy Johnson, who's a beauty blogger, she might say, uh, or a beauty influencer, she might say, do you want me to wear red lipstick today or purple? Screenshot the one that you hate or the one that you like, and then it'll inform what she actually wears. So bringing it full 360. You, so you, if you screenshot it, the person like Candy can tell how many people screenshot the image. And then it's a way for you to almost like blink twice if you hear me, like, it, you know, without actually <laughs> engaging with them. More questions here. And if you will repeat the question as you hear it. Um, I would say right off the bat, 
get an unbelievable amount of content about what goes into the creation of your film. Behind the scenes content, conversations people have, quotes that people say at any point in the production. Just build yourself a content library that even at times you might think, God, what, would people find that interesting? Somebody probably will. So I would just focus on telling a behind the scenes story in the creation of a content library to help you once you're ready to promote. That would be number one. Well, I'm ready. I mean, it's been streaming now for, for a year. Oh, so okay. that's what I'm asking you. So it's not like a new event. Oh, I see. Okay. But to, to engage and re-engage, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I can give you one thing. Um, just... If you can find some influencers, I don't think we're massive by any means, but highly engaged. And what, what's what's the vertical? I guess what's the what's the concept for this show? Uh, it's an adaptation of a Philip K. Dick novel, so it's science fiction. Great. It's been getting a lot of attention now. Oh, you got Blade a, Runner. Right, and it's about this authoritarian president mm -hmm. where there's a resistance <laughs> 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 okay. Scott Wilson, where there's a resistance movement. You know, I I kind of don't want to I don't want to capitalize on well, Trump's badness. Why not? <laughs> but, well, you, <laughs> but you've you but you've got man in you've got man in the high castle and you've got Blade Runner coming out. And so you could literally play off of that and connect to those the audiences that are fans of that upcoming major film event and say, you know, here's another Philip Dick project, property, or relation. I mean, that that's going to be monstrous by October. Have you identified the appropriate subreddit yet? On Reddit? The, the right, like, conversation on Reddit? No. You should just don't post anything because they'll stone you to death. But yeah. um, <laughs> So refrain from posting, but just... Just lurk for a while and grow and watch the platform, but knowing that science fiction freaks are totally on Reddit, me being one of them, you can kind of identify, okay, this conversation is going in the right turn and and, and either help find, find someone who can help you speak to that group, so find a Redditor, or learn it yourself and just start to talk in the speak in the conversation authentically. Don't be, don't try to sell your movie, but... Um, Things like thing, major things can happen overnight on the appropriate platform, and I think just hearing a little bit about it, it sounds like Reddit would be your yeah, for best uh, bet. great great point uh, for tuning whether it's Reddit or other platforms, and obviously be careful which platforms you post on. Um, social currency that's a great way for tuning. So actually having influencers that say, hey, come binge watch with me, or whatever is going to be for the piece of content, and if by doing so, I'll either comment and talk with you, or even if you want to get really out of the box and say oh, some sort of event that's going to happen, whether it's a Comic-Con or something coming up, come meet, have a chance to meet me and, and hang out with me and talk about this and meet the filmmakers, et cetera. So use social currency as a way to kind of drive a tune-in. Great. Thanks, Um When it comes to like, movies and TV, the pre-promotion of something that's going to be released, with all the video and the trailers and everything, how much is too much? Or is there too much before the audience becomes tired of something that keeps seeing trailers and different clips? At what point have they seen the whole movie? Or at what point are they bored with it? And if it's over-marketed, does that tell the audience that this is probably bad and they're desperate to get views? Uh, I'll say one quick thing is that usually, in, at least in media and marketing, we just say frequency is a good thing. Just the more times you see it, more likely you're going to ask uh, your friends to go see it with you. Um, I think, I think it's all about the sentiment. If, if people are, are excited about it and keep sharing it and it gets being seen on a positive note, I think, uh, and the only one I've ever seen it happen to the other direction where it was negative, but it would still worked out really well was Suicide Squad. Mm. That was still getting destroyed in the uh, in the critic side, but it was like, I have to go see it. It's, if it's this bad, I can't imagine it's this bad. Um, but most likely, yeah, you want a positive sentiment around that video and that should be endless because it ultimately just sharing great content at that point. It depends, it depends on the movie. If the movie's good, and you can tell that story simply and people get it, then you'll find you don't need to post 10 or 20 different spots. But for films that are trying to find their story through their marketing campaigns, which we see all the time, you know, we see studios posting 20 and 30 different spots where Pirates of the Caribbean has five spots right now. And they're getting huge engagement and huge reposting uh, ratios because you see a trailer and you get it. So it, it, it depends on the film. Yeah. I'm just thinking, looking at Twin Peaks, they released three photos, no yeah. videos at all. That's, that, a, that, that's a different challenge. That, that wasn't because they wanted to. Yeah. Uh, that was that was probably a more political thing than anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, they would have released more if they could have. But I would say you just think think about 
uh, being smarter with the things you release. And by that I mean uh, there is an amazing tools now to think about segmentation, where you think about which audiences. You can cut a trailer six different ways uh, and, po and dark post them to six different audiences, um, knowing that these are the things that they're interested in. And then you're going to have a more potent effect with the audiences rather than trying to have a one size fits all. And you're also assuming, I, this happens with clients all the time with me, they assume that every single person sees, sees every single piece of content, and that's just not the case. We're getting it from so many different places. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming.